Good afternoon, everyone. Let me ask you to take your seats and go ahead and get started. If you haven't turned off your cell phones, please do. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Damon Wilson. I'm Executive Vice President here at the Atlantic Council. And I'm delighted to welcome you uh, today for a discussion with an exceptional frontline diplomat, uh, US Ambassador to Ukraine, Jeff Pyatt. Um, <clears throat> our conversation today is about the future of Ukraine at an existential moment for that country. I'd like to offer a special welcome to our distinguished speaker and to our audience uh, that is watching online, especially all of those of you, all of those in Ukraine who have tuned in to our live broadcast. I also want to welcome the ambassador of Ukraine, Ambassador Mozak, who's with us, the Swedish ambassador as well, uh, and other distinguished colleagues. Thank you for being with us. Ambassador Pyatt was sworn in as U.S. ambassador to Ukraine in July 2013. From the start. He's been extraordinarily committed to supporting the Ukrainian people's right to choose their own future within an independent and secure Ukraine. It was exactly three months before Ukrainian students in Kiev began their first rallies against the previous president's decisions to walk away from negotiations with the EU when the ambassador took the reins. A year and a half later, as the political and economic crisis in Ukraine continues, Ambassador Pyatt is steadfast in his pursuit both of American interest and his support of the Ukrainian people. The Atlantic Council recognizes not only the importance of Ukraine, but also the implications of this crisis. Ukraine is not just defending itself. It is on the front lines of defending the order that has delivered security and stability in Europe since the end of the Cold War. That's why back in February here at the Council, when it was widely, if incorrectly, seen as a domestic crisis in Ukraine, that we stood up what's become known as the Ukraine and Europe Initiative. It's this initiative, this, this conversation is part of that initiative today. It's this initiative that galvanizes international support for an, international, for an independent Ukraine with insecure borders, whose people will determine their own future. And to advance this, the Council's work aims to strengthen Ukraine's security, preserve its territorial integrity, advance democratic, economic, and governance reforms. Ambassador Pyatt has been an ally in all of the Council's efforts. So it's a great honor to have him back in Washington to speak with us this afternoon. Today's discussion comes in the wake of yet another wave of Russian escalation in eastern Ukraine, as well as the appointment of a reformist cabinet, uh, new cabinet of ministers in Kyiv. <clears throat> I'm delighted that Ambassador uh, 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 I'm, I'm looking forward to Ambassador Pyatt's comments on the current events in Ukraine, as well as the ambassador's reflections on the trajectory of U.S.-Ukraine relations moving forward. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the stage over to Ambassador Pyatt for his comments on the crisis. Afterwards, uh, ambas after the ambassador's remark, the director of the Council's Dino Patricio Eurasia Center, former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, John Herbst, will join Ambassador Pyatt on stage for a moderated conversation. I want to encourage all of you here in the audience and online uh, to contribute to the conversation by sharing your thoughts and submitting uh, your questions via Twitter using the hashtag uh, uh, ACUkraine, hashtag ACUkraine. Mr. Ambassador, the podium is yours. Thank you very much, Damon. Thank you for the, the warm welcome. I want to start with a, a quick note of appreciation for the role that the Atlantic Council has played on these issues. And certainly, as I, I look back over my, my first year and a half in Ukraine, um, the breathtaking pace of change that the country has gone through um, and the expectations that Ukrainians have for the United States and for their European partners demand very detailed and close attention to what's unfolding. And certainly, the role that the Atlantic Council has provided in, in offering an authoritative window on the political developments in Ukraine is greatly valued, I know, by everybody in the US government, but I think also by our, our Ukrainian partners. So thank you for that, and I, I hope you will keep at it. Um, in so many ways, um, the crisis that Ukraine faces today is unprecedented in the history of the country. Uh, certainly the greatest challenge that Ukraine has faced since achieving its independence. Um, but it's also a moment of, of great opportunity. And I want to take a minute before we get to the questions and answers to walk through a couple of the reasons that I remain hopeful about what's unfolding today in Ukraine. Um, the unpredictability of this environment is, is extraordinary. Um, certainly, as you look back over the past year, 
There are very few who predicted that President Yanukovych would, would flee Kyiv at the end of February, few who predicted the invasion of Crimea, few who predicted the, the Russian strategy of, of hybrid warfare in the Donbas, uh, the insertion of, of Russian tanks, missiles, heavy equipment, and eventually at the end of, of the summer, the tragic shootdown of MH17 and the insertion of literally thousands of regular Russian army troops um, who remain present to this day in smaller numbers, but still with a decisive role in the uh, command and control and support of the, of the separatist forces. Um, the resolution of this crisis in the Donbas has enormous consequences for the Euro-Atlantic security system, for American interests in the region, um, but just as important, and indeed in some ways even more important, is what happens in the other 95% of Ukraine, um, how the reform project is sustained, um, and how this newly elected reformist cabinet is able to deliver on the very high expectations that the Ukrainian people today have laid out. Um, certainly, if I, I look back on, on this past year, um, there are very few who would have predicted when Yanukovych fled on the 22nd of February, um, that you would have in the space of the subsequent months two democratic elections meeting international standards, uh, which would produce a new government with a strong pro-European coalition, and critically important, a strong consensus on the essential requirement for reform. Um, it is democratic politics, and so there are issues of ambition and personality that still have to be worked through. But I think it's worth bearing in mind that at every critical juncture since the 21st of February, Ukraine's political leaders and Ukraine's Democrats have managed to put aside their parochial interests and have managed to focus on the long-term task of building a more democratic, just, and European Ukraine. So I think it's something to be celebrated and it gives some reason for optimism about the future. As I've said publicly in the past, I am absolutely convinced that the greatest single risk factor facing Ukraine today is business as usual. And the good news is that both the President, President Poroshenko, and Prime Minister Yatsenyuk, I know are fully aware of that imperative. Um, there are others in the political system who may not yet be, um, but I am absolutely convinced that if Ukraine is to surmount this crisis, which I've described, it's going to have to, the political class uh, will have to put aside the habits of the past and focus on implementing the ambitious program of reform that's embodied in the new coalition. So looking to the, looking to the, the months ahead, um, what's going to determine the success or failure of Ukraine's democratic revolution? Um, I'd like to offer a couple of suggestions about what to watch. Um, again, with the caveat that I noted at the top, that it's very, very hard at this point to predict uh, what's going to happen next in Ukraine. But a, a couple of leading indicators that I would recommend. I think first and foremost is the implementation of the governing coalition agreement um, that was agreed at the, end of, at the end of November before the final assignment of, of cabinet positions. It's an important document, um, incredibly wonky, Interesting, interesting legislative history. It began as the project of Dmitry Shimkiv and a couple of technocratic policy wonk advisors working around President Poroshenko. But it came to be the commonly owned product of the five political parties who are part of the governing coalition. It's important to understand how important that process was to identifying a roadmap that all the political parties would own, and which all the political parties felt they could take back to their constituents. Uh, President Poroshenko, in putting this coalition agreement together, was inspired by the example of some of his peers, other European leaders, who suggested to him that this kind of a roadmap would be helpful when it came time to get to the practical task of implementing these reforms. And so it gives reason for optimism that this won't just be 
a document which sits on the shelf, but actually can turn into a practical roadmap for the implementation of a reform agenda, which is going to entail significant and at times painful changes in critical sectors like energy and justice and defense and security. It's a robust document, and it's a document that all of the parties take pride in, and I think that's worth, um, that's worth taking note of. How to move ahead on implementation, I would argue, is something for, that only the Ukrainians themselves can decide. It's not the position of anybody in the international community to say which element of this multifaceted reform agenda needs to come first. But that said, let me suggest a couple of areas that I believe will be critically important to the success, to the success of Ukraine's democratic reform. Um, first and foremost, I would point to energy. There is no sector more in need of reform or more central to the fate of Ukrainian democracy than energy and energy reform. It has been the sector that has drawn the most egregious corruption under multiple governments in Ukraine's past. It's the sector that Russia has used as a vector of influence over Ukraine uh, to limit Ukraine's strategic choices. And it has been, because of its poor management, it has been a sector that has been a drag on economic growth and economic competitiveness. NAFTA gas alone takes a huge proportion of Ukraine's gross domestic product through the subsidies that it requires. Um, its losses are unacceptable. But it's not just about the, the gas sector. As we've seen this week with the electricity crisis, across the board, Ukraine is in need of modernization, the insertion of new technologies, and new practices. But the good news, and I say this based on a very encouraging meeting that I had on Thursday with the new energy minister, is that the government understands this, and it has a strong partner in the United States, and it has a strong partner in the European Union, whose ambassador joined me in our first call on the new minister. I would identify as a second priority the speedy implementation of the dramatic and important anti-corruption reforms that were promulgated in the last weeks of the previous RADA. I don't need to tell anybody in this room how pernicious the phenomenon of, of politically driven corruption has been in Ukraine. It has sapped confidence in government. In many ways, it was the root of the Maidan. And although the demonstrators Many of the demonstrators were waving the flags of the European Union. What they most were reacting to was the industrial scale corruption of the Yanukovych government and the sense that Yanukovych had taken the instruments of the state and had redirected them largely to his own personal financial advantage. So there's a political imperative to demonstrate to the Ukrainian people that the practices of the past will be changed. Now, I know this won't be easy. I've had prominent uh, business people who've come to me and said, Ambassador, you don't understand. Every vote in our RADA is influenced by different commercial interests. And that's exactly the point, that you've had a political system which in the past has been driven by these oligarchic politics. But that's now changed. And certainly one of the most inspiring things in Ukraine today is the emergence of a new generation of political leaders in the RADA in almost every political party who have come to office with a focus on achieving better governance and with an explicit rejection of the historic model of relations between the economy and business groups and the political process. They want to see a Ukrainian government that serves the interests of the Ukrainian people. A third area that I would highlight in the reform agenda that was agreed as part of the coalition is constitutional reform. This is a process that began under Prime Minister Yatsenyuk's first government, led by Deputy Prime Minister Groisman. Groisman talked at the time about wanting to follow the Polish example of dramatic moves towards subsidiarity, driving decision making down to the local level, empowering mayors and governors, and creating a system in which local government is much more accountable and also much better positioned to affect the quality of daily life. 
Um, this task is as urgent as it's ever been. I would note in particular in this area the critical technical advice that's been provided by European partners like Poland. And it's very clear, listening to the Ukrainian leaders that I've discussed this issue with, that they aspire to build a European model, they aspire to build on a European model of constitutional organization. And that's something which will affect not only the political space, but also the economic environment. It will affect these issues of corruption that I flagged earlier. And it's certainly something to watch. A couple of other leading indicators that I would, I would flag for the, uh, for the weeks ahead. One is the question of national unity. And certainly, I think one of the most inspiring things about living in Ukraine over the past year has been to witness the extraordinary courage, resilience of the Ukrainian people, uh, their decisive wish to seize their own future, uh, to change their destiny, um, and to build a country which is moving clearly in the direction of a more just society. Um, there was a fairly obvious effort by the Russian government uh, to try to defeat that objective over the course of the spring, uh, sowing a, a narrative division, uh, spreading a, a false narrative that Ukraine was a country on the, on the cusp of civil war. Um, I was reminded of how disconnected that narrative was from reality on Friday. I was in Kharkiv along with our Undersecretary for International Security, Rose Gottmuller. And I was last in Kharkiv, um, a reminder of how far things have moved, in October of 2013 when I went with Ambassador Tominsky to meet Yulia Tymoshenko in her, in her hospital jail. It was remarkable to return to Kharkiv, see Ukrainian flags everywhere, on the main streets, draped over the Shevchenko statue. This in a city that had been targeted by the political tourists who had been sent from Russia at the beginning of March to try to stir some kind of an uprising. I think this is one of the, the most inspiring aspects, certainly impressive aspects of what's happened in Ukraine is the emergence of this stronger national identity, the resolve to resist this, uh, this false narrative of division. Um, another bit of evidence in this regard, um, it can be found in Lviv where you've seen strong efforts by civil society to reach out to the east, to reach out to Donbas. Um, the efforts, for instance, that the Catholic University in Lviv has made to bring students from eastern Ukraine uh, to Lviv uh, to see that they can speak Russian, uh, to see that Lviv is not controlled by fascists. This kind of bridge building remains critically important. It needs to be an element in the process of governance. It needs to be an element in the way the government communicates, and it has been um, in the outreach that Prime Minister Yatsenyuk and, and President Poroshenko has conducted. Um, you can see it even in cities like Slavyansk, which have been so affected by, by the war. Um, but I would not want to suggest um, in any way uh, that we're out of the woods in the Donbas. I think both in terms of how the political crisis in the separatist-controlled areas unfolds, but also in terms of the reconstruction environment, again, in cities like Mariupol and, and Slavyansk, which were occupied by the separatist fighters over the course of the summer, and are now looking to Kyiv, looking to Kyiv for help with reconstruction, but also looking for clear signals that they will have a voice in governance and a voice in the future of the country. They clearly want that. They clearly have rejected the option of civil war and division that the separatists, the Russian proxies, and Russia itself have tried to impose on them. But the question remains, um, where will they fit into a united Ukraine? How will that be reflected in governance? Critically important as well in this regard is the role of the opposition bloc. Um, it's important to note um, that the opposition bloc has made clear their wish to participate in the process of reform, in the process of building a European Ukraine. I had the opportunity to, to meet with former Deputy Prime Minister Boyko last week in his new capacity as, as leader of the opposition bloc faction in the Rada. Um, he was pleased about the opening of the Rada, the way in which that was conducted, but he was also looking for a voice in the process of, of governing in the Rada. And that's going to be a challenge for all political forces. Um, 
as the opposition bloc and those who were part of the, the legacy party of regions uh, try to figure out how to leave behind the, uh, the, the poisonous history of, of Yanukovych and the damage that he did, um, but also to identify their role in a, in a united Ukraine. Um, third leading indicator that I would uh, commend to everybody's attention is the financial situation. Um, Yanukovych uh, bequeathed to Ukraine's new government a disastrous macroeconomic situation, which Prime Minister Yatsenyuk has done a commendable job of managing. It's worth noting um, that this government has stuck rigorously to the terms of its IMF agreement. It's notable and interesting, as Prime Minister Yatsenyuk points out, that despite the decline in the Ukrainian economy, despite the economic losses resulting from the war in Donbas, um, overall tax revenue collection is up. It's a suggestion that the administration of government is beginning to improve. Prime Minister Yatsenyuk also points out that at a macroeconomic level, um, Ukraine between January and November paid out about $11 billion um, in servicing its various debts um, and took in about $9 billion. So there's clearly a cash flow challenge that this government faces. Uh, we are going to work closely with the IMF, with our European partners, to support this government as it moves forward further down the reform pathway and seeks to manage its way out of the economic difficulties created by Yanukovych and exacerbated by Russia's military actions. Um, there's an IMF delegation in Kyiv as I speak and we are going to remain in close touch with the IMF, but also with our European partners. And here, too, I would, I would note the critical role that Congress has played and which I hope Congress will continue to play as we seek to resource the American contribution to this effort at a moment of unique opportunity, at a moment when Ukraine has begun to turn in a different direction. The circumstances are difficult, but they are not insurmountable. Uh, there is a wide understanding among Ukraine's political leaders today that the country's survival depends on more honest politics and meaningful progress down the path of reform, and we will support them as strongly as we can in that process. Um, lastly, um, let me talk just a little bit about the question of defense and security sector assistance. Um, as you will understand, I can't go beyond the statement that Tony Blinken made in his Senate confirmation hearing recently regarding the status of, secure, of lethal defensive assistance. But I would emphasize the critical role that we already have played with the expansion of our security sector envelope um, up to $118 million uh, with a commitment to do more. I would particularly highlight in this context the work that General Breedlove um, and European Command have done through our Joint Commission on Defense and Security Cooperation, which has partnered effectively with Ukraine's military leadership and has developed a roadmap for security sector reform, which is just as sweeping as what we've been talking about with ministries like Energy and Justice, and will be just as important over the long term in helping Ukraine to restore the ability to defend its sovereign territory and to deal with the challenging security environment that unfortunately looks to be a part of Ukrainian reality for the foreseeable future. Last point, and here I'll close and turn over to Ambassador Herbst. Uh, as I was getting ready to go out to Kyiv in the summer of 2013, I was careful to sit down with all of my, my predecessors. And all of them said to me in one form or another, Jeff, you know, at some stage you're going to have to deliver a speech about Ukraine's unfulfilled potential. Well, don't worry. When that happens, just open the drawer, and there on the left in the back you'll find the speech that I gave, and you won't have to change much of anything. Um, I don't think that's true anymore. Uh, in so many ways, this is a different country. It's a different country in terms of its security environment. It's a different country in terms of the expectations of the Ukrainian people. It's a different country in terms of the politicians, which are 
placed in whom the public has placed their trust. And it's a different country, I hope, in terms of the kind of partnership that we will be able to build over the long term between the United States and Ukraine. So I thank all of you for the contributions you've made to building this new architecture, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Jeff, thank you very much for, for a superb presentation, and one which focused on, focused on one of the two critical issues in Ukraine's future, um, the issue of reform. And it's important that you, you stress this because, in fact, in Washington, much more attention is being paid, paid to the security problem. And I think I will follow your lead and move on, on the reform side of the discussion. But let me first start with a, a, um, an observation. Uh, you are absolutely right that Ukraine's future will be determined um, not entirely, but to a large extent by its success in moving this reform agenda. No matter what next step of aggression Mr. Putin decides to take. And we have a very clear precedent for this. Uh, you know, thanks, to use a peculiar word, to Russian arms, to provinces of Georgia are right now no longer in the control of the government in Tbilisi. Despite that, because President Saakashvili, for all of his authoritarian tendencies, was a genuine reformer, the country, minus southern Ossetia and Abkhazia under its control, is able to make serious and real progress. And the same can be true in Ukraine. That's why this is not just urgent for the prosperity and well-being economically defined of Ukrainian citizens, but also for its sovereignty and ultimately its territorial integrity. And with that, because time is short, I'll only ask one question and then turn it over to the audience. Uh, you gave an upbeat presentation on why this Ukraine is not the Ukraine of the Orange Revolution. And I think you're probably right. But you also noted one very important factor, which is a negative. And you quoted someone who said that you know, the votes in the RADA reflect moneyed interests. So how in this new Ukraine, where civil society has greater power than it did 10 years ago, do we make sure, and by we I mean in the first instance Ukrainian authorities and peoples, but also its well-wishers, how do we make sure that those moneyed interests don't hijack the agenda? Easy question to begin with. A <laughs> um, couple of thoughts, and you put your finger on one important aspect of it, John, which is the resilience of Ukrainian civil society, which has been a source of inspiration, I think, to all of us who have watched Ukraine's political evolution over these many months. And again, it's, it's important to note that this coalition agreement, which I alluded to, was developed with extensive input from Ukrainian civil society. Um, in a way that would not be unfamiliar to Washington. Um, I think part of the answer to this question of how to break the oligarch politics nexus lies in the agenda of anti-corruption that the RADA in itself has implemented. Um, part lies with the politicians themselves. And I think it's important to note that this new cabinet, first of all, the presence of the foreigners who are in this cabinet, but really across the board um, is composed of individuals who have, been who have been known largely for their probity. Um, one of the first questions everybody asks about new ministers in key sectors is, is he corrupt or is she corrupt or corruptible? And I think that is a fundamental challenge, perhaps the fundamental challenge to the country today. It's important to Ukraine's political health it's important to Ukraine's economic health. It's also important to our partnership with Europe because the, the, the task of building a new Ukraine, building a new society, is going to have to be resourced. The United States will do a part. Europe will have to do a part. The IFIs will have to do a part. All of us are going to be prepared to invest only to the extent there is a prospect of success. Success will not be feasible if it is, if it is seen that resources which are devoted are then skimmed off to the same bank accounts that they went off to in the past. Uh, I think the, the, the rise of social media plays a role here. 
um, the scrutiny that Ukrainian civil society itself is imposing, and again, most importantly, the expectations of the Ukrainian people. And it, this is so hard to capture in a speech or sitting in a conference room in, here in Washington. But I think the sense that the Ukrainian people themselves have gone through a crucible moment and have decided that now is the time to build a different society. And that's something that the United States is prepared to make a significant investment in. All right. Thank you. I'll take audience questions. I ask people to please identify themselves once they're called on. Okay, Anders. Thank you very much, Jeff. Excellent. Uh, Anders Åslund, uh, Peterson Institute. One word that you did not mention is lustration, which is big with the Ukrainian government. Uh, and uh, Westerners, both Europeans and Americans, speak about anti-corruption measures, thinking about police and court. Ukrainians say lustration, deregulation. Both say, uh, sides say energy reform, as you did. Uh, how do you look upon illustration? We often hear the argument, particularly from the Council of Europe, that illustration is collective justice. We only accept uh, West, uh, individual justice in the West. My argument, as the Ukrainians, is that uh, the choice is between collective justice and no justice. The individual justice cannot function when the laws do, until the laws start function. What's your reaction? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Anders. Important question. I'll just say couple of quick things. First of all, most important is that this proceed in a manner consistent with the Ukrainian constitution based on the rule of law, um, not based on selective prosecution or manipulation of the, of the justice system. Um, beyond that, these are issues for the Ukrainian people to work out. Um, and I think the, you know, one of, the, one of the, the exciting things about Ukraine today is the sense of political awakening. Um, that began on the 22nd of February, um, or the 20, 23rd was when the RADA came into session again, uh, a sense of a country reclaiming its democratic future. These institutions have to now function based not on any council that comes from Washington or Berlin or Brussels, but based on what the Ukrainian people themselves choose. But again, on this question of illustration, the most important principle is it needs to proceed in a manner consistent with the Ukrainian constitution and in a ma manner that's governed by the rule of law. Thank you. Oh. Okay, first. Um, first of all, Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much. Um, Robert B. Croft, Office of the Inspector General, Department of State. We inspected uh, Embassy Kiev just before your arrival last year. And, uh, it's a little different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and John, but John Teff did leave you uh, a very positive legacy. Uh, you put energy at the top of your checklist. Um, one of the things we heard when we were there was that there was consideration being given to restarting reactors one, two, and three at Chernobyl. Um, I'm wondering, and they had been phased out in 2000. Has that continued as a, a means of filling the energy gaps, or is that now off the table? I, I've heard no discussion at all about Chernobyl. Um, obviously, nuclear issues loom very large in Ukraine. Fifty percent of Ukraine's electricity, roughly, comes from nuclear power. It's the largest nuclear power country in Europe, has the largest nuclear complex in Europe. Um, there has been discussion about how to expand that complex. Uh, that is a very expensive proposition, billions and billions of dollars. So it's not something that's going to be joined in any meaningful way in the next year or two. Thank you. My name is Laima Andrikene. I am a retired member of the European Parliament from Lithuania. I don't want to hide it. I, was, I, 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 I had my two terms in the European Parliament. I was on the Foreign Affairs Committee. I was one of those members of the European Parliament who were in favor of Ukraine's membership in the European Union. I'm not speaking, I'm not saying today or tomorrow, but immediately when, when the membership criteria are met, Ukraine should be in the EU. And we should forget, you know, about, you know, our enlargement fatigue, all this, you know, wording. And my question is about NATO. Uh, on the 30th of November, EU Commissioner Johan Hahn who is responsible for EU enlargement was in Kiev. And they know that issues which were on his agenda were 
NATO, Ukraine's membership in NATO, referendum on countries' membership in NATO. My question to you is where United States of America stand on this? What is your position on NATO expansion, taking into account all, you know, circumstances you spoke about? Yeah, no, Thank you. Important question. Let me start by saying um, how much I value my, my Lithuanian colleague in, in Kyiv. Uh, we have a very close partnership. Indeed, um, almost everything that I do in Ukraine is in coordination with either Ambassador Tominsky, the very skilled EU ambassador in Kyiv, or my other key European colleagues in Sweden, Lithuania, Poland, Germany, you can imagine. Um, and we tend to see eye to eye on almost everything, um, perhaps more than we agree with our respective capitals. Um, <laughs> because I think that all of us have a fairly clear conventional uh, consensus about, about where things are heading. On the question of NATO, United States policy has been very clear. Um, the open door will remain. Uh, the question of Ukraine's NATO membership is not to be decided in Washington or Berlin or Brussels, certainly not Moscow. It's a question for the Ukrainian people themselves to decide. Um, that being said, I think it's also very well understood uh, by the Ukrainian government that they are far from being ready for NATO membership and that if Ukraine wishes one day, if the Ukrainian people make the sovereign choice at some point in the future uh, to seek NATO membership, they need to do so on the basis of a thoroughly reformed society. So that's why I come back to the question of reform. That's the issue that's most important today, and it's the one where the United States is going to focus our efforts. Thank you. Um, Dana? Uh, thank you. It's uh, Dana Marshall with Transnational Strategy Group. Ambassador, thank you, John. Uh, Ambassador, my question is back to energy, but, but not so much the nuclear, but more the gas side. Uh, prior Ukrainian governments have sought as perhaps a short to medium term solution uh, the importation of liquefied natural gas, of course, requiring transit through the Turkish Straits. I wonder if you could, uh, in light of the new government there, the Pres pres presum presumptive cancellation of South Stream and shall we call it a fragile though concluded agreement between Russia, Ukraine with EU brokerage uh, just in the last few weeks. How does all this fit together? Is the new U Ukrainian government likely to uh, be interested once again in that option? Uh, might, there be, might they mount a diplomatic uh, effort to uh, in Ankara and is Turkey perhaps more or less likely to accept that, given all these other factors? Um, a couple of different questions there. Let me, I'll fall back on my remark about the hazards of making any predictions about Ukraine right now. Uh, but I will certainly say that for this government, um, diversification of gas supplies is a strategic priority. It's a strategic priority that the United States supports. Um, over the short term, the best way to achieve that is through significant further growth in reverse flow. Um, and there has been, even in the past few months, um, good news. The negotiations that Prime Minister Yatsenyuk conducted with his Slovak counterpart um, to get the Slovak route um, significantly expanded. There's further headroom, further capacity there. Um, Ukraine has also gone on to other European commercial markets. Uh, so you have commercial contracts that have now been let with Statoil. Um, for the foreseeable future, for the short term, Russia is going to remain an important gas source for Ukraine. But the important thing is that it not be a monopoly gas source, that Ukraine diversify its sourcing to the extent that Russia is just one other commercial supplier and the commercial negotiations between Gazprom and Ukraine take place on the same terms as negotiations between Gazprom and Germany or any of Gazprom's other customers. Uh, the question of, of LNG through the Bosphorus uh, is more politically complicated. It's something that the Ukrainian government continues to talk about, uh, but it's not something that I would see as delivering the kind of short-term prospect of, of significant growth that we see, for instance, through the further expansion of reverse flow options, or critically, through the expansion of Ukrainian domestic production both more efficient use of existing wells and also um, new production under their production sharing agreements with Shell and Chevron and others. Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, George? And then John. George. Uh, George Trubisky. I'm a member of Atlantic Council. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for uh, coming here today and uh, presenting the very enlightening uh, talk that you did. Um, I'd like to follow on a question from uh, my colleague here previously uh, about energy and Crimea. Um, what, what is our position, what is the position of the United States relative to uh, Crimea and the reassertion of uh, Ukrainian sovereignty over Crimea? Um, it's a little confusing when we hear statements from State Department to the fact that um, one way for uh, Putin to have the sanctions released is to um, implement the Minsk agreements, the provisions of the Minsk agreements, um, but there's no mention of Crimea. Does that mean that if uh, the Minsk agreements are implemented completely, the sanctions would be removed and Crimean Crimea would be allowed to remain Russian? Or is there another set of requirements that aren't being articulated that maybe we should be aware of? And I think this is particularly important, not just in light of um, the fact that this is Ukrainian territory and needs to be, and needs to have sovereignty reinserted, but Crimean territorial waters contain huge amounts of hydrocarbons, huge amounts, on the order of those that are in the Caspian Sea. And they represent they represent energy independence, not just for Ukraine, but really for all of Europe, if sovereignty is reasserted over that territory and those territorial waters. If it's not, then that just uh, further enhances uh, the Kremlin's monopoly position on ener as an energy supplier. Yeah. No, thank you, George. Appreciate the opportunity to clarify. Um, as far as the United States government is concerned, Crimea, to include all of Crimea's territorial waters, are Ukraine. Um, that policy has not and will not change. Uh, we are not going to recognize the invasion and illegal annexation of Crimea, period, end of discussion. Um, the question that you've referred to on sanctions is in the context of the additional more severe sanctions which were imposed by the United States and by Europe um, late this summer in response to the intervention in Donbass. And these should be understood as separate baskets uh, Vice President Biden and others have been very clear that for the United States, a prerequisite for discussing the relaxation of sanctions is full implementation of the Minsk Agreement to include the withdrawal of all Russian fighters and heavy equipment, the restoration of Ukrainian control over its internationally recognized border, monitored by the OSCE, and the release of all prisoners. Russia has not done any of those things. To the contrary, as we've said as recently as last week, uh, Secretary Kerry pointed out that since September 5th, since the signature of the Minsk Agreement, hundreds of Russian tanks and heavy military equipment items have moved into Ukrainian territory. And we know that Russian troops have remained in Donbas providing command and control to the separatist forces. So I think I would understand those conditions are connected to the sanctions which were imposed in response to developments in Donbas. As we've made clear from the beginning, we're not pursuing sanctions for their own sake. Sanctions are intended to, enchain, to encourage a change in Russia's strategic calculus and a change in Russia's activities. But they were also implemented in response to specific actions, and those actions have to be reversed. Okay, thank you. Um, John, and then Ariel. Thank you, John Quinstadter, Radzima Photo. Ambassador, thank you for the tireless efforts that you and the embassy are making. My question has to do with the response to the Putin regime's uh, disinformation war. And specifically, um, the words Putin has used in various speeches uh, are uncannily like those that Hitler used in uh, Nuremberg in 1938, September 38, regarding the Sudetenland. Yet, I don't recall that we are hammering, that we are trying to uh, point this out constantly to world opinion. Um, in, he's declared war on Ukraine, even if he hasn't done it in, in what lawyers might uh, define as a uh, legally declared war. And yet we seem to, and he's invaded Ukraine, and yet we seem, you used the word invasion for Crimea, correct, but the U.S. government doesn't seem to 
want to use the word invasion to describe these hundreds of tanks and the soldiers and the soldiers who've died there. Uh, within two days of the shoot down of the Malaysian airliner, one leading commentator practically named the Russian unit that had done it, yet the US government seems to be reluctant to name that unit and I, I have no information but I, I, I'd be willing to bet that we know precisely the Russian unit that did it. Uh, you've mentioned that you can't go beyond what Tony Blinken said in his confirmation hearings, but we still don't seem to be any closer to providing the lethal assistance that Ukraine needs. And I'd like to ask, where are the efforts to respond energetically to the disinformation war that the Russian government and the Russian media are carrying out? Thank you. No, it's, it's a really important question, and I think um, I've spoken in the past on the ways in which Russia has weaponized information as part of its campaign of special warfare, especially in the Donbass. Um, it is not a coincidence that the first thing that some of these Russian units did when they moved into key eastern Ukrainian cities was pull down the Ukrainian television and radio broadcasts, and I'm told by the SBU that these units actually had with them digital packs which they plugged into the racks in these stations to immediately switch over to Russian stations. Um, the Russian strategy, it's important to recognize about this strategy of special warfare. The Russian objective is not to win the argument. It's not to demonstrate truth. It's just to confuse. It's to create doubt and keep everybody off balance. And you know, that's why you had the little green men in Crimea. So everybody spent a couple of weeks trying to figure out, well, are these Russians or are they from somewhere else? You know, and who are, who are these guys in Slavyansk with, with new RPGs and earpiece radios? Um, it is a strategy which rests on a tactic of obfuscation and misdirection, which has as the strategic objective to sow division between the United States and our European partners, um, and which has as its objective on the ground in Ukraine to create fear, um, to create a sense of endangerment for Russian speakers. So I agree with you, it's a critically important issue. Uh, to be frank, um, we in the US government have only began the pro begun the process of thinking through um, how we need to respond to this, um, but we are doing so, again, jointly with our European partners. I was, I was in London, actually at an Atlantic Council event focused on this uh, a few weeks ago, the FCO has done tremendous work um, thinking about the strategic implications of this strategy. Um, the Ukrainian government also is struggling with the task of uh, strategic communications. And I would draw a strong distinction between propaganda and stratcoms. Um, I think it's important not to go down the rabbit hole, not to fall into the trap of trying to meet Russia on their ground in terms of misrepresentation or, or propaganda. But the best answer to that propaganda is the truth. Um, a consistent presentation of Ukrainian government reality and Ukrainian government intentions, including, as I alluded to in my earlier remarks, Ukrainian government intentions regarding Eastern Ukraine and the imperative of national unity. Okay, we've got um, eight more minutes. I'll take three questions. Okay, uh, Ariel, going over here, there, and right, okay, in the back. Ariel Cohen, uh, Center for Energy, Natural Resources, and Geopolitics. Um, I just came back from Russia, and in many conversations with the elites, uh, there is more than an undercurrent, there is, there is a message that Ukraine will not survive this crisis. Um, I do not know if our concerns about expanding the conflict zone all the way to Odessa and to the Moldovan border uh, are going to be uh, justified. But uh, taking what you were saying about the, the trying times for Ukraine, what are the contingencies to the extent you can disclose them uh, in Ukraine and our contingencies uh, to the development that go beyond Donbass? And do, do you think uh, this was just an attempt to um, engage in STRATCOM operations and convey this message that they think that Ukraine will 
not survive that? Or do you think something is really in preparation? Thank Jeff, you. Jeff, let's take the other questions and then we will. Right there, the woman right there. Thanks. Laura Jewett from NDI. Thank you, Ambassadors Pyatt and Herbst. Local elections will be important to uh, the decentralization process and also to further renewal of the political class. And I just wonder what you are hearing about planning for local elections, if that's in the works yet. Okay, thank you. And then John Kunstadter behind you. I mean, I'm John yes, Kunstadter. Yeah, John Gunderson, uh, Foreign Service Institute, National Defense University. Uh, I was Council General in, uh, in Ukraine and Sharjah after independence. Uh, I'd like to sort of push you on the one that I know it's very delicate to discuss, and that's security issues. Uh, two factors I think we should think about. One is Russian thinking, and I know we don't predicate policy, but looking in another uh, way of, uh, of uh, how we look at Russia, the heads of the uh -huh. Russian military were all, who are now generals, were all young lieutenants in Afghanistan, mostly. And the thing they fear most is an insurgency, it's sort of our Vietnam complex and Afghanistan complex. So the sense then of having to think about a strong Ukrainian military factors into Russian thinking. So I'd like you to address that and address the concept or answer what the arguments would be against giving lethal defensive equipment, the type of things we give to sovereign states such as Egypt and Pakistan, not quite friendly allies, friends in one way. So what is the argument against giving defensive lethal aid to Ukraine? Thank you. Okay, and the last question over there. Sorry. Um, Andrea Lari, I'm at Cato Institute. Two points. Uh, first one, from your comments as well, from the comments uh, that have been heard today here, as well as from the overall discussions, it's quite clear that uh, what we're talking about is not Ukrainian crisis. It's not crisis in Ukraine. It is war. It is Russian-Ukrainian war. It's Russian aggression against Ukraine. The question is why many U.S. officials, sometimes including you, preferring to use the term crisis instead of using more correct and more appropriate term aggression and war. Second, um, and why don't use it from today at least? And second, uh, three days ago, uh, there was the 20th anniversary of Budapest Memorandum. And in Ukraine, as you know, it's a little bit bitter feeling about uh, this. Don't you think that the mechanisms of Budapest Memorandum could, could be used at this moment? For example, in consultations that have been provided by Article 6 or in some other way? Okay. All right. Last one right there. Then you have like 30 seconds for each, Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. Alicia Saratani, EIR News. Um, as much assistance as... Uh, Ukraine might need right now from the United States and allies abroad. The reality is that the U.S. policy in Ukraine has nothing to do with Ukraine. It's everything a to question. do with, with destabilizing Russia. And um, I'm sure you listened to President Putin's remarks at the bicameral of, um, uh, address a couple days ago when he, he warned the You have 15 seconds to ask a question. He warned the international community that the last people to come after Russia to destroy them were crushed, and that was Hitler. Similarly, Germany, there is a letter circulating okay. in Germany signed by Gerhard Schroeder saying the same thing, making reference to Hitler, saying the last people to go after Russia were, were crushed. So my question to you is how, is, how is starting a third world war with Russia in the interest of Ukraine or the United States, how is this improving the security situation in the world? We need a button to cut off mics. Okay. I'll do lightning round on these. Uh, let me start with Ariel's um, a hypothetical. Um, I guess I, what I would focus on is, uh, first of all, the critical importance of these negotiations which are taking place in Minsk, hopefully this week, another round of contact group negotiations. Um, this also goes to John's question, because this is a crisis which is not going to be resolved on the battlefield. It's going to be resolved through diplomacy. Um, Yes, the United States has an interest in 
helping Ukraine to uh, develop the capacity to defend its sovereign territory. And we will continue to do so. We have devoted $118 million to that purpose so far this year. Um, but the, the end game is going to be played in the court of diplomacy. And the best vehicle we see for achieving that is the full implementation of the Minsk Agreement, which Russia itself signed on to on the 5th of September. Um, regarding Laura's point on local elections, uh, we just don't know yet. Um, you know, this is, Ukraine has been in a very rapid period of electoral politics. I would, I think at this point, and again, I'll, I'll be interested in what the experts advise and be interested in what the Ukrainian political leaders decide. But I would argue, um, having watched this unfold, that the important thing now is to move ahead on the process of constitutional reform that Deputy Prime Minister Groisman launched to figure out who is going to drive that process in the new government, now that Groisman has taken over as speaker, and then have, um, have that process precede the conduct of the local elections so that people know what are the packages of powers which they are going to be assigning through the, the local elections. So that's, that's my view on where we stand on it today. Um, on the Budapest Memorandum, you know, it is not a coincidence that our Under Secretary for International Security, Rose Gottmuller, um, was in Kyiv on the 20th anniversary of the Budapest Memorandum. Uh, we are very proud of both our nonproliferation and disarmament partnership with Ukraine, where I would point out uh, Ukraine is a global leader. Um, Ukraine's role in the new President Obama's nuclear security summit was one of the most important of any country. It is a country which has made the right choices on nuclear disarmament, and the world is a safer place as a result of the choices that Ukraine has made. Um, it is important, therefore, that we do all we can to uphold uh, and help Ukraine to defend its own territorial integrity. Um, that is why President Obama has led the international effort in imposing a cost on Russia for its violation of Ukraine's territorial integrity. Uh, that is why we have worked as hard as we have on the sanctions regime, uh, which is intended to affect Russia's calculus. And lastly, on the question of Russia, I, I would just note, I, I have been very clear on the record uh, from the days of my confirmation. We think over the long term, Russia should see this as a win-win proposition that a Ukraine which is economically prosperous, anchored in European institutions with access to European markets should represent uh, an economic opportunity for Russia and Russian companies. Uh, I'm very intrigued by the proposals that President Poroshenko has made for a free trade zone in the Donbas region. So the Donbas, while Ukraine moves ahead on its European choice, as it moves towards deeper integration with European institutions, so that companies in the Donbas region would be able to provide a bridging role between the European space, the largest economic space in the world, and the Eurasian space. Uh, but this is, that kind of win-win calculus has been absent so far from the kind of language that we've heard from Moscow, and we hope that we can get to that point. Jeff, thank you very much for this terrific discussion. Thank you all for coming.